All right, um, welcome back everyone. So uh, I hope you had a good meal. Um, so the next speaker, Chai Gorski from Israel, will present uh, a talk uh, titled Understanding Dominant Capital, the case of Israeli commercial banks. So here we go. Thank you so much. It's okay, I can do it. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon. Yeah, now the stop timer is work working, everything is fine. The following presentation is based on two main sources. First, the research done by Bichler and Nitzan in the global political economy of Israel, chiefly the outline of historical transformations of Israeli dominant capital. Another is the theoretical framework laid out in the global political economy of Israel and further formulated in Capital as Power. Although I chose to use examples from the Israeli reality, the main purpose of the presentation is to demonstrate the potency of analytical quantitative tools in the empirical assessment of capital. Some of the calculations presented here will explore the left-hand side of the capitalization equation, namely differential accumulation in its crystallized final appearance as relative stock price. I will attempt to add quantitative aspects to some of the historical power processes described in the global political economy of Israel in order to enhance our capacity in exploring similar processes in other contexts. The second part of my presentation is a tentative approach to develop the delta of the right-hand side, the risk factor, one of the elementary particles of capitalization. I will endeavor to deline delineate a quantitative approach to the rudimentary ideas about risk from capital as power to deepen the debate on the nature of risk and its measurement. I will conclude by proposing ensuing research questions to further and expand our understanding of dominant capital beyond the limited scope of the examples here shown. To recap, Bichler and Nitzan suggest the following capitalization equation as the basic algorithm of the capitalist nomos. K equals E times H divided by RC times delta. Whereas K is capitalization, E future earnings, H hype, RC, the normal rate of return, and delta, a risk coefficient. Clear so far? Great. Uh, we add an ind index D to the formula in order to indicate dominant, and we get KD equals HD, etc. We will regard the previous formula as representing non-dominant capitals, and with, when dividing the two, we arrive at the differential concept. Now, since the founding of Israel, the two to five predominant commercial banks have been well rooted in the highest echelons of its political economy. This is why, for the purposes of this inquiry, I chose to use the corresponding Tel Aviv Stock Exchange branch index to represent dominant capital. Indeed, the branch index includes other banks as well. However, these have always been rather relatively small and the historical tendency is of consolidation. In order to characterize non-dominant capital, I chose a second Tel Aviv Stock Exchange Index, Land, Construction, and Development. This index consists of hundreds of smaller firms. Unlike the banking sector, which is almost fully represented in the weighted average and functions as an oligopoly, the thousands of private constructors operating in this field render it relatively competitive. Moreover, the share of Palestinian workers in construction had risen consistently throughout the years to nearly 50% of the workforce today. This fact must be taken into account, in, to my opinion, and is intrinsic to the validity of the dominant-non-dominant differentiation in Israel, at least until now. This tendency is prevalent in many of the Israeli sectors. On the other hand, the key sectors of water, electricity, military, and finance, not excluding, excluding banking, have always remained almost exclusively Jewish. As Emmanuel Fajun pointed out in the late 1970s, this dual labor market reflects a dual economy. 
the big economy, including the commercial banks with its uh, union, Jewish unionized workforce, and the small economy with its numerous construction contractors based on Palestinian menial work. Thus, the first chart will present a comparison between the aforementioned indices and the ratio of the first to the second. Visible? Great. So the top thin black line stands for the commercial banks index, the thin gray line for the construction index, and the thicker colorful line below is the ratio. The ratio of the first to the second depicts in a nutshell the history of Israeli capitalism. Four major accumulation regimes are reflected as waves in this history. The slope of the trend line is approximately 8% per year, meaning that the commercial banks have increased their power over the construction capitalists at that rate. Now, the detailed history of these accumulation regimes is brought in the global political economy of Israel. However, I will review it shortly because I think it is necessary for my argument. So, following the 1948 transition to state capitalism, emerged a breadth regime that was marked with the loot of the Palestinians, large foreign capital inflow in the form of the German Holocaust restitution payments, plus aid and loans, and large Jewish immigration waves. I'm talking about the leftist wave, the black wave. Uh, on the surface, this external breadth regime was structurally characterized by the supremacy of the government. Under the surface of the government ultimate control, the dominant capital bloc, the Israeli big economy of the 1970s and 80s, consolidated. During the 1950s and the beginning of the 1960s, the banks composed an integral part of the state capitalist mechanism. At the same time, the major banks were busy swallowing up the declining numbers of small competitors and cohering with the industrial sector, formally and informally. During 1965 and 1966, a severe recession caused by the government gave a final boost to the consolidation process. Hundreds of small to medium firms went bankrupt or were merged into the larger groups. However, the 1967 war supplied the declining breadth regime with cheap Palestinian workforce and a captive market, and prolonged its survival by a few years. Yet, by the early 1970s, the dual political economy came to front, and the dominant capital, as the prominent component of the big economy, took the stage as the main force in the Israeli political economy, driving a depth regime against the small economy and the rest of society. And now we are in the orange or yellow, I don't know. Or we call it wave. Predominant in this regime were the arms trade and finance sectors, using stagflation and war as main instruments of accumulation. The banking groups had undergone structural and personal shifts and were ready to push on to the next phase of Israeli dominant capital and maximize utilization of the newly implemented debt regime. The second half of the 1980s, despite a carefully planned hyperinflation and arsenals of stock market swindles that were very lucrative for banks for over 10 years, viewed a decline in the relative power of dominant over non-dominant capitalists. Israeli capital entered a new breadth regime beginning in the early 1990s, only this time it was much less, less Israeli, and we are now in the blue wave. Privatization, so-called, and transnationalization had transformed dominant capital once again. Between 1995 and 2005, the major banks have been, have, were transferred to private hands, often foreign. However, in the early 2000s, with the global trend, a new wave has appeared which corresponds with the current global crisis, pink wave, and this new depth regime which has sprung to life is still prevalent globally and in Israel. Now let us have a second look into the aforementioned division of waves. Although I gave it color to four waves, I colored four waves, a minimum point amidst the yellow one stands out and somewhere around the early 1980s and might urge us to question the validity of this uh, aforementioned division. I'm talking about the minimum point here. For the Israeli collective consciousness, the slow point in the relative power of banks during that period might evoke the memory of the October 1983 banks crisis, in which the bank stocks crashed, dragging along with them most of the stocks in the market. The crisis forced the government to nationalize the banks, exposed and alleg allegedly uprooted a system of stock manipulation, and even entangled some bank executives in criminal procedures all in favor of re-establishing an imaginary competitive banking sector. 
of course. So let us have a closer look into these turbulent years. This chart is simply a zoom in to the first, focusing on the period between 1979 and 1986. Notice that the x-axis values are end-of-the-year figures. For example, the maximum point in the ratio in 1985, I've lost the mouse again, here it is. This point is the December 31st, 1985 ratio of indices quotes. Now, the minimum point is not at the end of 1983, as we might have expected in accordance with the accepted narrative. Rather, it occurs at the end of 1982. And of course, I'm referring to this point. The actual banks crisis is not the 1983 stock crash. Although during 1982, both indices rose, the construction index rose faster than the banks index. Accordingly, the ratio falls to its minimum at the end of 1982. This and no other is the crisis from the differential point of view. In fact, as the bank's managers realized, the stock's manipulation was losing its differential effectiveness, and they initiated the stock rush of 1983. And a good bargain they struck. Although both indices fell during 1983, the non-dominant one dropped more than the dominant. Differentially, 1983 was not a crisis year, but marked the beginning of a new surge in the power of banks. The government paid the bank's debts with tax money, the so-called nationalization, some of the managers related to the stock manipulation were indeed sacrificed, but the banks moved into the future to lead the last years of the debt regime with a three-digit inflation rate. Indeed, a grave change took place, but not grave enough to alter the entire accumulation regime. As mentioned earlier, the final demise of the debt regime was not received till the early 1990s. And another point I would like to illustrate. The next chart plots again the same are two indices in thick lines, only this time normalized to 1980 equals one, hence perhaps the graphical disc discrepancy, and adds other Tel Aviv stock exchange indices plotted in dotted gray lines. The pattern remains. During 1982, the bank's index rose less than the others, and during 1983, fell less than the others. What is interesting here is that the order of the series almost co fully corresponds to the ranking of the indices according to the number of firms in each index, from the smallest number of banks included in the commercial banks index to the largest number of construction public companies in the corresponding index. The next analysis I will present is also quite simple from a technical point of view, but I find it to be very revealing. This chart plots a series of five years moving correlations between the commercial banks and construction indices. Throughout almost all recorded years, there has been a very tight correlation between the indices. The two major aberrations happened during 1966 to 1970 and 1993 to 1997. Generally speaking, and even as I've been taught in finance class, perhaps the one actual empirical fact mentioned in that class, all the stocks and markets tend to move in tandem in the medium to long haul. And indeed, this tendency is clear from this chart. This fact only ren renders the strong deviations more suspicious. On the surface, both these five years periods were during breadth regimes. In retrospect, they may have signaled the decline in effectiveness of, the, of these breadth regimes and the need for the entire system to initiate a change of tactics or an entire accumulation regime. Moreover, not only do stock prices tend to rise or fall together throughout the years, but also the branches' market values for both short and long terms. The correlation coefficient of the commercial banks and construction market values throughout 1974 to 2010 is 0 0.96. Now, using the same technique of five years moving correlations on the market values series, we get this chart. This time, very, sim very similarly, we have one aberration in the period between 1987 and 1991. Recall that these years were the final years of a long depth regime. And so, using the simple technique of five years moving correlations on the price or market value series, forms a seemingly powerful tool to analyze and outline periods of profound structural change, a change of accumulation regime.
note, note that the 1983 to 1983 turmoil, 1982, sorry, to 1983 turmoil, leaves a relatively small, even though not insignificant, track in these graphs. This gives ground to the claim that the local minimum point in 1982 in our first graph does not indicate a shift to a different, different accumulation regime, but a turning point within the depth regime itself. Now, to the left-hand side of the cap to the right-hand side, sorry, of the capitalization equation. As seen in numerous other examples, the earnings factor has a decisive influence on price, especially in the longer hell. The same applies here, as can clearly be seen in this graph. The price series is the, is the one marked with the black line, and the earnings series with the dotted gray line. We note that the price to earnings correlation coefficient throughout the years 1974 till 2011 is 0.93 a remarkably high figure. However, the other elementary particles present on the right-hand side of the capitalization equation have a far more significant role in the short term. Short term. For instance, the average nine, nine years moving correlations of price to earnings vary from minus 0.42 to 0.98, averaging at 0.74, much lower than the long-term measurement. I would now like to briefly present a partial attempt I have made with the aim of quantifying risk, the delta of the right-hand side of the equation. Bichler and Itzan suggest that for dominant capital, risk is a denominator factor in the equation. Okay, the delta in the denominator, great. Meaning that there is a negative connection between price and risk. This is contrary to the liberal creed and is at odds with it in two aspects. First, the liberal dogma insistently claims that bearing risk yields increased prices, an ideologically obligated positive connection. Second, ever since the works of Markovich, conventional finance theory has based its notion of risk on price volatility on the left-hand side of the equation. The notion of risk, Bichler and Itzan suggest, measures a degree of confidence pertaining to the earnings series, pertaining, sorry, to the earnings factor on the right-hand side of the equation. I have set to explore this proposition and did so in a very straightforward fashion. I have tried to assess the volatility of the earnings series and then simply to plug the result into the equation, ignoring for the meantime the hype and the normal rate of return factors. To stress, I do not argue that the volatility measurement should, even tentatively, cover the notion of degree and confi of confidence, but merely try to estab establish a starting point for future research. And so, I simply created a series of standard deviations. I'm sorry if this looks awful, awfully technical, but I want things to be very clear. Uh, a, st the, a series of standard deviations of the annual change rates of the earnings. Uh, such series can be built either as forward-looking or as backward-looking. For instance, the 1990 figure could be the standard deviation of the annual change rates of 1990 till 1998, and then be called forward-looking. That is what we are seeing here. And vice versa, the same 1990 standard deviation could be defined as the standard deviation for the years 1982 till 1990, and then be marked as backward-looking. I then divided the earnings figure with the standard deviation result. If this maneuver, if the proposition holds water and the mode of calculation has any touch with reality, should produce a series which is more tightly correlated to the price series than the original earnings series. And now the suspense. Okay. The left thin black line is the fabricated price index, meaning earning meaning earnings divided by the forward-looking standard deviation series. The, and the left line, to make sure, it's this line. The right thin black line is the earnings series divided by the backward standard deviation series. I chose these two segments since the correlation coefficient between the fabricated price index based on the division of the two is significantly higher than the correlation coefficient of earnings to price during these periods and not during other periods. The correlation coefficient between price and earnings during 1986 to 1994 is 0.68, whereas the correlation coefficient between price and the earnings divided by the forward-looking standard deviations is 
The correlation coefficient between price and earnings during 1995 to 2003 is 0.56, whereas the correlation coefficient between the price and earnings divided by the backward-looking standard deviation is 0.82. These results might suggest that this inchoate formulation of risk is not void. And if so, our discussion of the relation of risk to price, similar to the discussion of of the relation of earnings to price entails a temporal dimension, backward-looking or forward-looking, or actually anything else in between. Uh, we can, for example, we can include information four years backwards and five years forward. Furthermore, using a somewhat extended analysis on other data, it seems at times that the price-to-risk connection flips from negative denominator risk to positive nominator risk in varying periods and companies. Thus, Another dimension should be added to the risk taxonomy, and this too should not necessarily be dichotomous. To conclude, all of the quantitative tools which I have presented are valid as long as we use them for the right objects, price dominant and non-dominant capitals. In the examples used in this presentation, it seems that the comparison of the stock market branch indices is fruitful in this respect, but it is not so in the general case. If the branch indices were not as discerning in differenti differentiating dominant from non-dominant capitals, the results from the prior analysis would not be as clear-cut. I believe that in order to widen our analysis and render our discourse more rigorous, two interconnected features are missing. A systematic mapping of owner rel ownership relations, or perhaps power blocks, as we might hear later on the conference, and a quantitative measure of the dominancy of a business unit, which I, th I think it's, a, it's an issue also addressed in one of the following uh, presentations. For instance, just rudimentary ideas, Kaletsky's degree of monopoly or other formulations of markups might serve as a good starting point for assessing dominancy. Yet, of course, since the framework of neither a single corporation or branch is sufficient to elucidate capitalist relations, we would, need, we would need to use similar quantifications on rather more complex entities. The, again, the, the power blocks or ownership structures, I still don't have any concrete ideas. Uh, that's about it. I'm very happy to be here and to have people to discuss and to le learn from. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chai. We still have uh, five minutes if you need it. No? Sorry. Right. So, <laughs> so, so let's move to the... I was told it's not an, uh, a sin to go under time on conferences. Right. I don't know. Good job. So let's move to the question period. Anyone? Hmm? I thought we had oh, from 05 to... Questions, commentaries? Uh, thank you very much, Shai. I think that uh, your presentation has two dimensions. One dimension is the Israeli case, and the other dimension is the uh, technical proposition that uh, you presented regarding the measurement of, of risk or the beginning of measurement of risk. And uh, possibly w one way to expand that, I think, would be to examine uh, the indicators in many other countries uh, and at many different levels. So this is quite independent of the situation in Israel, and perhaps the situation in Israel is uh, just a minor case study. Uh, in my opinion, there is nothing to prevent you from uh, developing a, a multi-level um, dimensional kind of analysis to try to uh, present alternative measures of risk based on this kind of uh, uh, computation, so I, th I think that should be carried forward in that direction, that is uh, my, my suggestion. S um, certainly, I can, re I can re address uh, your comment. I first, first of all, I'm, I'm not an official student anywhere, so I have some <laughs> problems accessing data, but uh, 
the, for instance, I've tried on the little data I managed to, to collect to do the same uh, to do the same analysis, and as I've mentioned in the end of the presentation, sometimes we the the relation between nominator and nominator and denominator risk flips. It, the risk seems to act as in the liberal story. Now, I of course I will, and uh, as I hope to get access to data data soon enough, uh, will expand the the analysis, but I'm. But the reason I chose the Israeli, the Israeli case study is because I think we have a very clear differentiation of dominant from non-dominant capital, and for that reason I also went through some of the, briefly through the historical sketch to try and convince that this is a very clear cut of dominant and non-dominant differentiation. And uh, once we lose the differ this differentiation, um, our analysis is much weaker. So this is so. Certainly, I'm, I must do it, but it, it, I think it has to go hand in hand with other research as well. It's not independent. It's not independent risk uh, surveys on the data I know is specific companies, uh, sectors of whatever stock exchange market, or these these are these are the measurements I know, and I don't think there are enough. Any other questions? Comments? Still have uh, 20 minutes. Yes, this is just a, a simple question. Um, at the beginning, why did you choose as your series land construction and development? Um, and would you think that those same correlations would be found if you had chosen manufacturing, for example? Okay, I've reviewed other. I I went over other um, in branches as well before I decided to use these two specific branches. And as I've uh, suggested in one of the graphs and uh, describing the crisis here, you can see a very gradual pro you can see a very gradual morphing, if you want, between the when the construction is almost always the extreme, and the bank the, the banks and constructions are almost always the extreme uh, and that is and uh, I've tried to convince you also through other arguments that the construction and land is inherently non in a non-dominant capital capital uh, capitalist uh, measure while others I think are less clear-cut are more I mean manufacturing for instance has Ties has much has the index itself includes much larger factories that has much that are much closer or are dominant capital, and the manufacturing I think does not or to a much much lesser extent. Uh, I don't know if the question now is gives a, you can answer that based on your research, but is there any connection? Um, between the current um, revolt, so to say, or demonstrations in Israel, and that story that you are telling. Mm -hmm. I mean, as in if, if, is there some kind of shortening, for example, of housing or something going on? If you, if you start uh, um, uh, under um, uh, searching the, the construction sector, I mean, is there, is there a re relation between the current social situation and the story that you're telling? I don't know. Ah, okay. <laughs> This is actually more a comment, and, and maybe you actually mentioned this, and I missed it in your presentation, but contrasting the two seems to make sense, since wouldn't the land construction and development corporations, there is a direct relationship between them and the commercial banks, is there not, where the banks can deny or get, grant them access to the capital necessary for their projects, and so that direct link also sort of serves to justify the fact that you're you're comparing these two when we can almost inherently see that the banks should have power relative to these companies. Um, I 
don't have a direct response. So. Uh, I'd like to answer because you said you don't know uh, to Ulf, uh, because that's a question that has to do with resistance. Uh, I think that in Israel, what we saw last year uh, uh, is a situation quite similar to uh, the underpinnings of the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, th there have been studies that uh, demonstrate that quite a lot of the uprisings uh, in the uh, less developed countries in recent years are tightly correlated with rising prices, with inflation, essentially with the rising cost of living. And in Israel, uh, the uh, uprising, if you can call it that way, is in some sense uh, sort of the revolt of the homeless middle class. So these are people essentially uh, consider themselves professionals or uh, with prospects of being professional and are unable to actually uh, purchase a home or, or even afford the rent. Now, this has to do with the price of land, whereas the construction sector is, is uh, fairly fractured and small and what a neoclassicist would say competitive. So the construction sector is not really the the sector that benefits from rising uh, prices of land. Uh, this will be, uh, this will have to do with the people who actually uh, own the land or uh, the land in Israel, of course, is leased from the government for uh, a long period of time, but it's not really reflected in the construction sector. So the construction sector mi might include, you know, small contractors that actually build houses. So it's very much connected to prices, just like in the Arab Spring, but you wouldn't see it actually in the index of construction, the construction sector. No, he has a question. Um, sorry, I was a couple minutes late, so maybe you said it at the start. Um, listing on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange is going to be a self selecting bias of a form, I mean, is, 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 are the listed firms that are represented in the, in the uh, I mean, I assume all commercial banks are listed, but is it the case that there are many small firms in the construction industry so that what is listed is, is different from a representation of the sector as a whole? It's, n it's not a representation of the sector as a whole. As, as in whole, there are a huge number of private constructors, but as I've mentioned, it's the Fair, it, it makes the, the the branch fairly competitive, relatively competitive, as as John, uh, like Johnson said, and um, I've tried to count the, the number of uh, firms registered in the in this index, and it doesn't decrease. I mean, there there are big firms, there are big con big construction public firms which grow but not in, it doesn't resemble anything as concentrated as any other index. I hope this answers your question, I'm not sure. More questions? So are we moving to the next presentation? Thank you very much. Thank you.